More on philosophy. I said we're going to cover a lot towards the end here. Uh, epistemology. We mentioned that term. It's a branch of philosophy that's concerned with knowledge. How we know what we know. Uh, can we trust our senses? Is uh, reason reliable? Um, <clears throat> and so forth. How do we assess truth? How do we assess evidence? And so forth. Uh, one analogy that you might have heard of is, is what we call, um, well, it's, it's tied to what we call an optical illusion. So some of the philosophers like Dave Hume, for example, um, would say, look, um, if, just to give a more of a uh, modern analogy, say you're standing on a railroad track. It, 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 and you're standing way over here, and as you look ahead, it appears as though these tracks become one. That's an optical illusion. You're on the freeway. You have an 18-wheel truck rolling by, you know, 65 miles an hour, and you're changing a tire. Soon as it blows right by you, you know, it's the size of a gnat in about, I would say, less than 10 seconds, right, as it goes by you. Optical illusion. Um, Aristotle, some of the ancients would say, you know, you take an oar, like you're rowing in a boat, in a rowboat. You take an oar and stick it in the water. What happens as soon as it goes through the surface of the water? Say right here, you have one oar going in. It appears to be bent, right? So that would be an optical illusion. Well, never mind that the ancients solved that. Actually, we know from further investigation that the oar is not bent, right? It's not an optical illusion. Rather, your senses are recording what appears to be the case, what appears to be true. So, in that sense, given the surface of the water and the ore going through it appearing to be bent, your senses are actually recording that correctly because the truth is the ore appears to be bent. What if your senses recorded it as though it were totally straight? Well, then you would be inaccurate because it appears to be straight. That's what the surface of the water would do to an ore or any object stuck in the water. So, in that sense, keep that in mind when the skeptic says, you know what, the rational man cannot ever trust his cognitive faculties if you've been deceived by them even once. All right? Therefore, knowledge or certainty is not possible. So uh, that doesn't work uh, because, again, the optical illusion that we would be accused of is not true. Our senses are recording it accurately. All right, epistemology. To say that one believes something to be true, belief, is different from that belief being true. Uh, when the critics ask, for example, how do you know Christianity is true, this is where uh, we enter the realm of epistemology, a branch of philosophy concerned with knowledge. Uh, a brief summary of the what and why of epistemology is what I'll address right now in a nutshell. We will touch on this further uh, in other courses, but this is just an introduction to philosophy. So for now, think of it th this way. To attain a belief or just holding to a certain belief is, is, is easy. You know, a lot of people do that. But to figure out whether that belief is true sometimes requires a task. For example, you, you might believe that, that, that you are Jesus' twin brother, but the question remains, are you really his twin brother, right? So belief and true knowledge are two different things. Now, you can believe things that are true without knowing fully that they are true. Uh, but yet, belief and knowledge are typically two separate categories of knowledge, all right? Um, there are those who believe that there are no true beliefs. You know, the relativist or the radical skeptic, skeptic for example, you know, radical skepticism, you can't know anything for sure. But that too is self-refuting because if you can't know anything for sure, how would you know that for sure, right? Sort of like, you know, the statement, all things are relative. Well, if so, is relative relative as well, right? All right, so there are those who hold that certainty with regard to belief is impossible. And I already mentioned that. Uh, epistemology, again, is a branch of philosophy that deals with these issues, study of knowledge. Epistemology, for our purposes in this lecture, uh, is what we call epistemic, epistemic justification, epistemic justification. So the question is really then, what is knowledge? Uh, what do we know? How can we know? What can we know? Uh, what can uh, we uh, never know, for example? Uh, how do we determine a true belief? 
How is knowledge and certainty acquired, if at all possible? And this is interesting given planning as an evolutionary argument against naturalism that I uploaded in the prior lecture in regards to epistemology. So you can tie these two together. Uh, these are epistemological questions and issues. Now in philosophy of religion and apologetics, religious, epistem religious epistemic justification is vital. And that's what the world is asking us. Look, give us some answers here. They're not just going to accept necessarily uh, that God exists by just talking about God. Uh, what is God? Uh, a, a frozen strawberry in Alaska? A, a lamp post? Is it Shirley MacLaine? Are we all gods? What is? What do you mean by God? Yeah, I believe in God too. Who? Allah. You know? No, that's not the same God we're talking about. So, it's important that we are clear in our beliefs here and then try to defend them. Okay, so there are three varieties of ways of knowing something. Uh, one is knowing that, THT, knowing that I am here speaking right now. Two is knowing how, knowing how. The know-how is different from knowing that. Three, knowing or knowledge by acquaintance. So knowing that, knowing how, and knowing by acquaintance. For example, number one, knowing that I know that I love epistemology. I know that Hollywood is in California, unless we're talking about the smaller Hollywood in Florida. Um, that would be a different type of knowledge than, say, uh, I know how to speak Spanish. I know how to skateboard, all right? So know how to speak Spanish, Swedish, whatever. Knowing how to skateboard, surf, you know, jumping out of an airplane. The know-how is different from knowing that. And knowing that and knowing how is different from knowing by, knowledge by acquaintance, such as, I love the Lord. I know Pastor so-and-so. Um, it might be, um, say for example, um, funny little illustration, I might believe that eating 54 burritos daily is healthy and that exercise is a bad thing. A person could hold that the belief that the X-Files, the TV show, are based on real-life events and that the president is a visiting alien. Now, our current president, he actually might be, setting aside jokes. Uh, and, of course, this um, visiting alien at the White House is about to take America hostage. Now, you might have people that believe that, but we call them nuts. You know, things are not working cognitively. So the question, therefore, arises, are my beliefs true? Apologetically, we must deal with that. See now how philosophy, philosophy of religion, epistemology crosses over, right, to theism, apologetics, Christian knowledge, Christian truth. And reason is on our side. Reason is on our side. We can at least justify that we can rely on our minds to discover truth, all right? I didn't say spiritual truth because I believe the Holy Spirit ha has to aid us in that process. But uh, in any event, to develop a theory of knowledge is of utmost importance. Uh, validity, again, is, is, is a tool of logic, while the soundness of an argument is a tool of epistemology. Remember, we talked about validity, truth, and soundness. Valid, uh, valid arguments where the premises follow, follows from the conclusion, but a sound argument is where the conclusion follows from true plausible premises. So bottom line here, knowledge requires truth. When a belief is appropriately linked to the truth, the belief counts as true knowledge. So far, you've seen that knowledge is a certain type of belief, uh, but necessarily uh, um, in the realm of apologetics, when you engage the skeptic who comes in a variety, soft skepticism, hard skepticism, our approach to epistemology becomes even more and more important. So what then are some of the features required for a given belief to count as true knowledge? All right, I'm going to give you a set of beliefs, and then I'm going to give you a second line, beliefs counted as knowledge. So first, set of beliefs. I believe I am pretty, she says, is different from beliefs counted as knowledge. I know that I, Nick, is Swedish. How about this one? I believe that lard is healthy. That would be a set of beliefs. I know that Calvary is a church. That would be counted as knowledge. A uh, set of beliefs. I believe that God exists. Completely different 
different from, I know that the Bronx is on the East Coast, New York City. Set of beliefs category again, I believe that candy is not good for me. Uh, whereas beliefs counted as knowledge, I know that stretching makes me kick better. Uh, set of beliefs, I believe, uh, <laughs> believe, a little Swedish coming in. Uh, I believe that my bike was the best buy at all, say a motorcycle. Belief counted as knowledge, I know that I have $2.11 in my bank. So different types of belief versus knowledge here. The fact that I believe, she says, not me, that I am pretty is what we call a preference claim and not necessarily true. This is not to say that the truth is in the eye of the beholder. It is not in the eye of the beholder. Preference claims are different from truth claims. I prefer vanilla over, say, a chocolate ice cream or vice versa. I gave the analogy that, you know, if you show up in India, you might ask yourself, why is there not a McDonald's on every street corner? Because they believe in reincarnation and they believe in eating meat. You might be eating grandma and we don't want to eat grandma. Therefore, uh, stay away from eating hamburgers, for example. Well, we would agree with them morally, morally, in that uh, cannibalism is wrong. We don't like to feast on grandma either, but there is a moral sameness, sameness. We agree on that, but the factual is where we disagree. We don't believe that the hamburger is a reincarnated grandma or used to be her and so forth. All right. So the fact that I believe I'm pretty is a preference claim and not necessarily true. Uh, the idea that I believe I got my bike at the Best Buy is an issue of trust belief in the salesman telling me so unless I did my knowledge, I mean my research and came to that knowledge like, look, this is going to be the best buy ever for, say, a black crown chopper. All right, so here I could be wrong in my belief since I'm, it may be an assumption. The claim that I know I am Swedish is, on the other hand, one, based on memory, two, proof, a birth certificate, passport, although my ability to speak Swedish doesn't make me a Swede because you could learn it, since I could have learned the language elsewhere, or maybe I'm a CIA spy. For example, the statement that I believe God exists might get the reply, well, how do you really, really know? So the strength of a belief doesn't make it true. Just because I strongly believe something doesn't make it true either. The fact that the majority may believe that something is true doesn't make it true. The hoi polloi, the masses, uh, are not necessarily correct. So in that sense, for example, the majority of Nazis uh, believe that in committing X, uh, is right and it's true according to Darwinian evolution. Uh, the fact that I'd like for this or that to be true isn't helpful either because now you're stuck in the preference realm. I like this or that to be true doesn't make Hinduism, Buddhism, Darwinism, atheistic naturalism true uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the like, I feel this or I feel that or I feel the Lord spoke to me this morning. Well, let's hope that if he did in your, in your devotional, let's just hope that that verse was in its historical context. Because if it's ripped out of context, nine out of ten times, I'll say, ten out of ten times, it didn't come from the Lord. Because Matthew, Pete, Matthew, Peter, you know, John, Paul, they're not here today to answer these questions. So you have to look at the grammar, uh, its historical uh, milieu, if you will, and, and, and understanding the context of what Matthew is writing about. Yeah, sure, the Holy Spirit's going to illuminate you, but if the Holy Spirit gives you a different meaning from what Matthew intended, well, it's probably not from the Holy Spirit, because whatever Matthew wrote down only has one meaning, not two, not 50, not 20. So when you have, again, people sitting at, at, at a church, you know, after they play canasta or bingo, and they read a verse and says, what does that mean to you, Betty? What does it mean to you, Paul? What do you think it means, Tom? And everyone says, well, I'm going to become a millionaire. To me, this passage means I'm going to go fishing tomorrow, or, uh, um, you know, I'm going to win the lottery. No, it can't mean all of those things. It means one thing and one thing only, and that's what Matthew had in mind. The Holy Spirit illuminated him to write that down. That same Holy Spirit is not going to give you a contradictory meaning. It can only mean one thing. This is not to say that there are general truths and specific truths. All right? That's a complete separate issue. All right, so the strength of a belief doesn't make it true no matter how much you strongly believe it. The fact that the majority may believe in something doesn't make it true. The masses could be incorrect, and you can be mighty and wrong. You can be uh, small, Mother Teresa, yet mighty, and not necessarily a Stalin or an Obama. The fact that I'd like for this or that to be true doesn't make it 
true whatsoever. It is therefore, uh, this is why we say that um, a belief should be appropriately linked to the truth. The belief counts as true knowledge when the two are linked. Um, I already addressed fideism, critical rationalism, and strong rationalism, but I'm going to throw it in here because I believe it ties together. There are three main schools of thought within philosophy of religion, and these deals with ep epistemological questions. Number one, fideism, which is again a faithism approach to religious belief. Two, critical rationalism, I would be of that school, in that some things within religion can be proven while other things cannot be proven. Third, strong rationalism, way too bold. All things must be proven before we espouse it as true. Um, so, fideism, fiducia in Latin, fideism, critical rationalism, and then strong rationalism. Um, my approach, um, again, would be critical rationalism, also known as evidentialism, or close to evidentialism within the realm of apologetics. Um, when it comes to, to issues now of, say, origin of the universe, mankind, meaning of life, where is morality coming from, what is meta-ethics, is there a human destiny, you know, the system of thought, whether it be a philosophy, a religion, you name it, the worldview that can answer these questions the best and argue against other contradictory propositions and win sort of by um, the process of negation, winning by the contrary. Um, is the worldview that you should uh, espouse. So, again, some of these tests are, number one, factual support, multiple facts to prove something. Uh, number two, more than one line of evidence. More evidence is better than little. Number three, able to refute other worldviews. Do we have the best system versus competing theories? Internal consistency. Um, is our approach in agreement with itself? Or is it, say, a, a document like the Bible, internally consistent versus self-contradictory? Um, one example of internal consistency uh, would be uh, Mormons are not internally consistent. They, on the one hand, says the scriptures, Christian scriptures, Judeo-Christian scriptures are, are true, etc. But so is uh, the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine of the Covenants, etc. But the problem is... Uh, Mormon writings contradict the scriptures, so you can't have them both. Either uh, God is unchanging, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, he's self-existent, he's, he's a, a non-contingent being, he doesn't depend on anything, he's uh, immutable, unchanging in that sense, everlasting, uh, and therefore did not milk cows, saying Utah, and then became divine, nor could Adam be the first God of this world, as they used to believe, because, again, God, who's un uh, unchanging, immutable, and so forth, is the one who created Adam. So you can't have it both ways. That would be violating internal consistency. Um, explanatory power, number five. Does the system have strong explanatory power? Uh, six, it must be non-counterintuitive. Does the system make claims that go against moral and logical intuition? It's absolutely counterintuitive uh, to say, for example, torturing materials for the mere fun of it is morally neutral. I think that is counterintuitive. Therefore, uh, for example, in that case, moral relativism has a really, really bad start. Um, seven, historical adequacy. Uh, can the theory or claim be historically verified? I think, for example, evidence for the resurrection, you don't have to uh, necessarily adopt a philosophical apologetic understanding of uh, an argument for miracles, an argument for the divinity of Christ, just to understand that he rose from the dead. Look, the tomb is empty, all right? Historically, let's look at what happened historically, what known documents we have, and the type of reasons that we have involved. All right, you guys, which is us, say that he rose from the dead. All right, I'm going to be a Jewish rabbi. I don't believe that. Why is the tomb empty? Did he steal the body? Uh, where did it go? Did he swoon? What, what, did Jesus have a twin brother that, that got out of the tomb and said, I am he? Well, if so, where's the real body? The tomb is still empty to the day. So where is the body? When you look at rival hypotheses against the resurrection, you're going to find out that they just don't stand the test of time. In fact, you can go on, on, uh, on uh, YouTube or Google, and you can Google Frank Pastore. Uh, he's now with the Lord. He interviewed me on Good Friday a few years back, I believe. And uh, that one was uploaded 
on uh, in our uh, church history class, but not in philosophy. But if you want to know more about the resurrection of Jesus, that was a that was a fun interview with uh, Frank Pastore on KKLA uh, 99.5. Uh, all right, so you would type in Pastore, P-A-S-T. Um, O-R-E and Kihas interviews, and you should see it. All right, uh, historical adequacy. Again, can the theory or claim be historically verified? Once you understand the historical arguments, now you can just go, you know, the best explanation is Christ rose from the dead. I don't know how, but maybe God exists. All right, negation to the contrary by the totality of demonstrative evidence, demonstrative evidence, as in a court of law, do we win in negating what is contrary to our claims? Again, negation to the contrary. By the totality of demonstrative evidence, say, for example, the above, do we win in negating what's contrary to our claims? Those that disagree with us, do we win uh, in that sense? And then nine, correspondence. Correspondence theory of truth. Does the system of thought correspond to reality? Very, very important. All right. Now, uh, let's see here. I'm going to move on. Thus, for, for, uh, thus far, we can set forth that to hold a belief and claim is, uh, is to have knowledge, and justification is the necessary component. You might believe, again, that Moscow is in Hawaii or that Norway is a suburb in Los Angeles. But once more, belief is not enough. No matter how strongly one might believe or hold to such a belief, and you find this in the cults, for sure, burning in the bosom, uh, and so on. We can only know something, claiming to know something, if it's true. Um, on the, and of course, a strong rationalist would really hold on to that. So I take that somewhat mildly. Um, yet I wrote this years ago, so um, there it is. On the other hand, we all hold to true beliefs that are true without knowing them to be true. For example, if I ask you, what's the capital of Japan? If you're not sure, but simply guess the right answer by saying the capital of Japan is Tokyo, here you got the right answer, but you didn't know it. It was simply a guess. Therefore, knowledge is a true, justified belief. Um, let's see, and that came from Plato. Um, he was the first one to suggest that definition. Knowledge is a true, justified belief. But then again, um, there are other ways um, to discuss what a justified belief is. Presuppositionalism versus evidentialism have gone back and forth on that within a Protestant apologetics for a long time. Uh, this takes us to the most essential question. Again, uh, in epistemology, how do we know? Uh, if you were to take a pen, if you were to pen down Everything that you believe, do you believe that you could claim that all these beliefs are true? Write down everything that you believe. All your beliefs, you write it down. Hundred sheets of paper, hundreds and hundreds. Which of these could you say, I know that for sure, I know that for sure. We hold beliefs that we just accept presuppositionally to be true. We assume that they're true based on this and that. And, and, and our assumptions might be based on other assumptions that are false. So you can sort of see how the cobweb uh, ties together here. So there are different criterions of how to define knowledge and how to arrive at truth and what are the necessary components of justified belief. And this depends on what school of epistemology one adheres to. Um, if you take the, the critical rationalistic approach, uh, again, like I mentioned, evidentialism, when it comes to theology, philosophy, science, and ethics, um, I would try to be very precise in what I espouse as knowledge and what I hold to be true and what I believe I can justify and claim as true, epistemically true, justifiably true, where everybody should just fall over backwards and go, I believe the same thing. Um, from an evidentialist point of view, if the reasons for the non-existence of God are lacking factual support, presupposes a theistic framework when arguing uh, from morality, say the problem of evil, uh, and is unable to philosophically and scientifically discredit arguments affirming atheism, then the evidentialist, in my view, wins by the totality of support on a scale of explanatory power, cosmology, teleology, uh, anthropology, uh, ethics, and so forth. 
Um, yeah, there are degrees of what we call plausibility, degrees of plausibility, and also what is most probabilistically true. Uh, those are other terms you want to keep in mind. Uh, finally, the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the believer is something that cannot be proven philosophically. Uh, yet, we are justified in believing in him at work within us because of experience. All right? This is what we could call the self-authenticity of the Holy Spirit in the believer. All right? Something that's very hard to prove. And that, of course, sounds like fideism. And we'll be hit on that. People will accuse us of the self-authenticity of the Holy Spirit while we are evidentialists on the other hand. So you've got to try to solve those two. However, for the most part, we may consider that uh, to justifiably believe something to be true, uh, to judge by experiences is not the strongest option. I would certainly say that the self-authenticity of the Holy Spirit is definitely uh, sound and it's grounded in other issues such as the reliability of the scriptures, you know, just Christian theism in general. So it's not, we just say, you know, I had a burning in the bosom like the Mormon says or the Holy Spirit showed me. No, it's grounded in the Christian worldview, general revelation, natural theology, special revelation, uh, the historicity of the scriptures and so forth. It's reliability and of course the resurrection of Jesus, right? So, uh, having said that, three main views within epistemology, skepticism, again, no justification exists to claim a, a certain belief to be true. Um, nothing can be known. We hold beliefs, but can I claim to know them? That would be skepticism. Empiricism, E-P-I-R-I-C-I-S-M. Empiricism says the best way to justify a belief is by being able to verify the belief empirically, seeing them. Touching them, the five sense approach, touch, smell, hear, see, taste. And then you have rationalism. The rational, logical evidence is the necessary component to justify true belief. Now, literally, these schools are not fond of one another. They have argued for centuries. For example, Paul encountered again the Stoics, uh, skeptics at Mars Hill in Acts 17. Old empirical skepticism and the church attacked the, uh, the believing Galileo, remember that, in the 15th century. And then rationalism was, in a sense, illegal in the church, you know, some say, uh, up till about the era of Thomas Aquinas, you know, uh, the 1400s. Um, I mean, the 12th century, I should say, 1224, 1274 was Thomas Aquinas. And they say that he Christianized much of Aristotle's uh, rational philosophy, and I don't think he did. I don't think he Christianized anything. I think he saw the general truths that Aristotle, Aristotle discovered and just says, you know what? It is all coming from the true God of Christianity. All right, the skeptic, particularly what we call global skepticism, global, like worldwide, global skepticism versus local skepticism, argues that we have what we call sense deception. I mentioned Dave Hume early, earlier, you know, the ore in the water, or the railroad tracks joining becoming one. Uh, repeatedly, we are deceiving ourselves according to them by our own five senses. So again, you look down a freeway, it looks smaller. Once you walk up, you see that it's apart. It didn't shrink as you walk down the road or whatnot. And so look, you were deceived by your own senses. You can't trust them again, and so forth. So what are some of the problems here? problems here for this type of skeptic. Uh, we'll go A through H. One, further investigation will educate us that the freeway is not narrowing down. Uh, two, when our sense report that the freeway, for example, or the railroad tracks are narrowing down or becoming one, uh, it's in a sense an accurate report since it really appears that the lanes are narrowing. It appears that way and our, you know, uh, optical uh, nerves and, and brain and memory are, are really deducing that correctly. It appears to be thinning down or narrowing down or the two tracks on a railroad track becoming one. You run up there and they're still apart. Uh, C, the skeptic is not skeptical of his own skepticism. He believes it to be true and anything else contrary to it really should therefore be false. You should, you ought to adopt his skeptical viewpoint because it's the only quote unquote rational position, right? but yet he's not skeptical of his own skepticism. Um, a D, uh, skeptic here, remember St. Augustine, I've alluded to this earlier, uh, some skeptic walked up to him and says, so Augustine, prove that I exist. Do I exist? And Augustine says, who wants to know? Love that. I dropped that on a guy at the Hard Rock Cafe in uh, 
in Los Angeles before they tore it down. A uh, skeptic came up, sat next to me, and I was reading some philosophy or something. And uh, he says, oh, what are you reading? I said, philosophy. And, uh, and he says, uh, all right, well, prove to me that I exist. And I did the whole thing. I think, therefore, I am. Or I am, therefore, I think, yet, cogito ergo sum, Rene Descartes. He goes, yeah, I know that stuff. I go, even better. Let me just ask you this. Because he would literally say he wasn't sure that he was there. God puts the funniest people in my path sometimes. So I'm sitting there next to the guy. He goes, I'm not sure I'm even here. That's the type of skeptic I am. And if you pinch my skin, if you pinch me, I'm going to say that could be part of my illusion. Prove me otherwise. So I just quoted, just, I mean, Augustine. I said, ask me a question. He goes, what? Ask me if you exist. He goes, do I exist? And I looked at him and I says, who wants to know? He goes, that's a good one. Because there has to be a who doubting the who existence in the first place prior to doubting it. Therefore, you are here. All right. Rene Descartes, 1596-1650, was told to question everything, including his own existence. Descartes attempted to question all of his beliefs. He was asked to do so by the skeptics. Yet, he discovered that he was doubting everything. And if I am in doubt, there must be an I that exists. I am, therefore I think, or I think, therefore I am. Um, what else? Uh, F, uh, we can be sure that one thing that always remains constant is change. We can be sure of that. That would be Heraclitus, right? But there's a logos behind, the, behind that, uh, that change. Uh, G, we can also be sure that no one steps into the same river twice, <laughs> not even once. We can be sure of that. I'm using Heraclitus as... Uh, relativistic examples, even though really he was an absolutist because of the logos behind it. Um, that works in our favor. And we know that mathematics has no largest number. You can always add another number because math is finite. It begins with one, you can go two, three, quadrillion, ninety. It has no largest number, period. Now, the empiricist, the empirical evidential approach, holding to five cents uh, five cents methods of how to arrive at truth, he proposes, uh, or actually presupposes, things that are not verifiable within his own framework. He's actually doing philosophy prior to empiricism, empirically verifying it, right? Putting in test cube, light on fire, and out comes, you know, an acid in liquid form or something. So he's actually doing philosophy before his empiricism. How? Empirical science is typically the approach you see in the natural sciences, like astronomy, biology, etc. But here are the problems. One, logic is not verifiable according to the five senses. It is philosophy. The empiricist is using logic first, prior to him launching his own criterion of how to arrive at truth. Uh, we must also ask what led the empiricist to the truth that true belief can only be acquired through the empirical framework. The answer, again, is logic. Uh, to claim that nothing can be known is self-defeating. Again, you can't know anything for sure. Well, how do you know that? Um, science, or scientism in this sense, is empirical. Empirical science. We must ask the scientists, again, what led you, Mr. Scientist, to the truth that only the scientific methodology is adequate to arrive at truth? He will have to answer philosophically. He can't do it scientifically. Mathematics is also philosophy. The scientist often uses mathematical formulation, formulations and equations prior to his empirical approach. Numbers, you know, do they exist? You know, they're symbols. They're mental constructs, just like um, moral claims and logical claims. You don't see science, I mean, logic floating around or, or moral truths floating around. They're part they're part of the moral furniture of the universe, the rational furniture of the universe, sometimes even more real than the candle lit in front of your face at Christmas. All right, the rationalist maintains that our knowledge is based on basic beliefs. Pure reason is the main ingredient for the rationalist. Rationalism holds that there are certain propositions we know to be immediately true, such as seven is, is a larger number than six, or two statements that are contradictory cannot both be true at the same time and in the same way. That would be the law of non-contradiction, A cannot equal non-A, or that the proposition that God exists is either true or false, we can know that, or liquid water is wet, or dogs are animals, or all effects have causes, or all white horses are colored animals, or every triangle has three sides. Therefore, certain propositions are self-evidently true. Self-evident truths require no justification. So these are self-evident truths. 
The question here is, is it logically possible for these propositions to be false? When we talk about necessary truths, like the examples we listed above, white horses are colored animals, we mean that they are true a priori, from the former, prior to looking at the facts. They are a priori ideas. Certain propositions are true from the former. For example, horse, that horse is white. Well, obviously, that's a colored animal. So there you got a priori and needs no more justification. Or all sweets are from Sweden. Well, obviously, um, I don't have to see a Swede. I don't have to look for or look at a Swede or even experience a Swedish person to know this to be true, that all Swedes are from Sweden. It is a necessary truth. Uh, this is different from a posteriori. A posteriori, look that up in the book, true from the latter, in Latin, from the latter, L-A-T-T-E-R. So the latter approach is what empiricism is all about, meaning certain experiences from the latter are necessary for this and that to be true or known. For example, you can only know that my son, Nikau, has a certain color of eyes from seeing or experiencing him. You can never know this a priori or before seeing Nikau. Uh, the main attack on rationalism comes from logical positivism. That's in your book. Hence, in short, it is argued that a priori truths are analytic truths stemming within the realm of analytic philosophy. The claim that all bachelors are unmarried, though an a priori truth, it, it's not an interesting truth about the real world at all. It's not like, okay, what did I learn about that? Okay, all bachelors are unmarried. Okay, that truth has nothing of importance to me. It's a very uninteresting truth. It doesn't do anything for, for me, and hopefully not for you either. The same goes for, you know, for many people about mathematics. Mathematical truths uh, don't mean anything to, to a lot of people except for counting what you have in your wallet. Well, I think you can deduce your way to the existence of God by just looking at math. Um, we covered that in prior classes. So the, the, the debate on these ideas will continue. The purpose here is to make you think about the importance of epistemic justification. Um, it seems fair to say that a combination of <laughs> fallible empiricism and rationalism in this sense is a good mix. Uh, to start with self-evident or necessary basic truths, we're on the way to develop a good Christian epistemology in developing a Christian worldview and being able to evaluate or refute philosophies hostile to what we believe. Uh, these tools can only aid our defense and strengthen our walk with him. So having said that, um, I think we will end on that point. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Shalom.